my absolute pleasure to introduce Veronica Mullins-Moore. She is a seasoned patient advocacy professional and research expert dedicated to health equity, inclusion, and public health education. With over 16 years of extensive experience, Veronica has been deeply engaged with patient advocacy organizations and healthcare professionals focusing on critical areas such as clinical trial design, community engagement, self-advocacy, patient engagement, recruitment, and education. Her career has been predominantly dedicated to serving rare disease patient communities, and she's also a Hypersomnia Foundation board member. Lucky us. Veronica is also the di Associate Director of Global Research and Development Rare Disease Patient Advocacy at Amgen, and she also lends her expertise as a patient engagement advisor for the Drug, Drug Information Association at Tufts University, Tufts Center for the Study of Drug Development, and Duke University Clinical and Translational Science Institute, and a host of other patient-centric organizations. Welcome, Veronica. Hi everyone, it's so good to see you again. It's so good to be back in the space of um, the Hypersomnia Foundation Conference. Um, thank you to all of the patient advocates in this space. Thank you to the support partners, the physicians, the researchers. Let's give everyone our own round of applause and clap for ourselves for the work that we've done to get to this point. I am between you and lunch. And I'm gonna honor that, respect it, but I need your cooperation. I need this to be a conversation, dialogue. Let's have some really honest conversations around the bivocal view of rare sleep. I've intentionally made this session no slides, so it's like a no homework session. You have no homework. <laughs> Just work with me here and keep the conversations going. I apologize for the mic team if there's questions or people want to raise something. But I like to move around to keep me awake, so let's stand up and shake it off right now. If you need to stretch your arms, do some jumping jacks, it's a no judgment zone, but like, let's just move our bodies here because like, I'm between lunch and I wanna honor that, but I need your help here. <laughs> um, so as me, I'm Veronica, I'm a board member of the Hypersomnia Foundation, a patient advocate. Um, patient educator, but I'm also a human and a person. So whenever I come across individuals with a lived experience of a rare rheumatic or severe inflammatory disease, the first perspective is that you're a person and the disease does not define you. Um, so when I thought about um, all of these things, I thought, you know, bifocals. But before I get into any of the meat and potatoes of today's session, the thoughts and views ex expressed today are my own, not reflective of my employer or any other business entity or organization that I'm affiliated with. Just have to give that statement. So these are all my own thoughts and views. So when we think about bifocal view, who has corrective lenses in here? Show of hands. <laughs> um, and some individuals may already be at the stage where they need bifocals. Some may be nearing that stage. Um, but when we think about what is right and near in front of us and then what is in the distance, when it comes to having a sleep disorder or condition paired with another chronic disease, we don't know what's near and what's far sometimes from day to day. Um, and I think we have to acknowledge as we go and have so many, much, so many more opportunities for research and development in this space of rare sleep, it's imperative that we as advocates researchers, pharmaceutical companies, keep in mind that patients are not one-dimensional. We have multiple dimensions, we have multiple diseases, conditions that we're co-managing and that we're living with, and sleep is the foundation. Lack of, too much, not enough, whatever we wanna define that. We see that in the healthcare system, that sleep is the core foundational to some of our illness or diseases getting some just really focused attention. Um, but it's important for us to make sure that we balance out what is right there in front of us as far as what we have control over and maybe what we may see in the distance. So we're going to dive into some of these strategies and tactics of how do we communicate with our healthcare teams to making sure they're keeping in mind that I just don't have IH. I have IH, but I also may have another chronic condition 
And when I come to your office with a chief complaint, don't just land on what's easy. Let's dive into what the core issue is that I'm coming in the office for for my chief complaint and how can we advocate for these multiple specialist teams to come together to find out what is the root cause of whatever we're bringing to the table at our sick visits, okay? Once again, no slides, so I'm gonna ask some questions. I will feel free to raise your hand or just blurt out. I'll repeat so the audience on the online streaming can tune in too. Online audience, you're not excluded. Please keep the chat live. Please stay engaged. We have people on the lines that can also weigh in and add commentary and comments as well. So when we think about um, the medical system, and the healthcare system globally, because um, we're not just thinking about individuals in the US. Dr. Ross said it really nicely yesterday that the medical system is pretty siloed. And with that being siloed, unfortunately, the burden falls on the patient and the care partner, the support system, to figure it all out. Luckily, you have individuals like the Hypersomnia Foundation, you have patient advocates, you have researchers, you have industry partners that have advocacy people in the space to help address the silo system as best as possible given the, the confounding limitations that we all have. So there are people that are trying to fix the system that we know that is broken, but at the same time we still need to challenge each other and there needs to be shared accountability between the patient, the care partner, and this hectic and exhausting healthcare system that we have. And people are not in the business of doing harm, let's be very honest, but there's a lot of competing demand in the healthcare system regarding time, revenue, compliance, payers. There's a lot of layers and systems in there, but there are areas of improvement for shared accountability. When we think about how we, um, the burden of where patients, where the burden sits within the, the silo medical system, it falls on the patients. And a few examples is um, you have a rare sleep condition, but you also may have um, hypertension. You have a rare sleep condition, but you also may have a, um, a digestive disorder. You have a rare sleep condition, and you also have Renal syndrome. You have a rare sleep condition, and you also have anxiety and depression. So there's multiple specialists that are coming into the system um, in that you're trying to think about from a multidisciplinary team. And sometimes you don't know where your complaint should sit, um, for example, and that can be very frustrating for patients. And one of that burden is, I'll just say this as far as my chart and sending in messages to your physicians, raise of hands where the frustrations of you don't know where on the list to send your chief complaint. Should my pulmonary, pulmonologist know this? Should my neurologist know this? Should I, should I start with my PCP, even though they really aren't my, like, my, my main stop for my IH? But I think my pulmonologist should know this first. Show of hands where you don't even know where to start to send in a, me a message or which doctor. So the burden falls sometimes on the patients to kind of figure out where that first point of stop is. And then secondly, when we think about um, some of the labs and the information that we get back from the physicians, how do we share that information back with the appropriate specialist? And sometimes, once again, we as individuals feel like the burden's on us. Even though there's systems and there's healthcare systems and databases, but we sometimes fall that the burden falls on us. So how can we all put our bifocals on and making sure that not only us have our bifocals on for what's going on right now that may impact the, the future or the far distance, but also that our healthcare teams have their bifocals on as well. So I want to talk about um, some topics and tips and tricks. So what we're gonna do is go through um, some tips and tricks and how to, some things that we found that have been helpful based on um, some of the patient stories, um, some of my experiences of working in advocacy for so long and working across a multitude of rare diseases. Um, and then 
also just a lived experience of working in the hospital system, working um, on the research side, and also working in the patient care setting. So all those different dimensions, some of those tips and tricks I'll share um, today. But I wanted to ask the audience because me standing on stage, do you no know service if you're not getting what you need from me? So when you think about bifocal view of rare sleep and your multi-care team, is there anything in the audience that you really think we need to drill down and talk about today? Well, I think we need to solve the problem of being able to find a physician to begin with, whether it's a pediatric person who's treating sleep disorders or um, somebody who's treating young adults or adults, because that is a huge barrier. Yeah, so that's the first step of finding the right specialist, right, when it comes to any kind of, not just rare disease, but any kind of specialist as far as chronic or disease that you want it to be uh, properly managed. The Hypersomnia Foundation does have some resources on the website. Now, I will say there are not enough sleep specialists that are well-tuned, trained, and educated um, across the U.S. and globally to support where people can just pop up like a Walmart or Target and find a sleep specialist. Guilty, that's a fair statement. I feel like there could be op opportunities to get more trained physicians um, in this space to provide timely care, and we feel confident in that. Um, a lot of the individuals that are living with some sort of sleep condition or sleep disorder, on average, they have to visit at least more than three physicians to get to the right specialist that actually hears them and is knowledgeable and aware and informed of what IH is or what narcolepsy is and how those two may or may not be intertwined based on their symptomology, too. So I definitely agree that we need to have a bigger pipeline of physicians and specialists so that people do not have to drive from Wisconsin to New York to find a specialist, that they feel confident, comfortable, and empowered, and feel like they can have that shared accountability um, experience with. Um, getting our specialists to communicate to each other. You're jumping ahead of me together. here. You know, you want to come on stage with me? <laughs> I'm, <just> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But you know what? Come on, come on over. Let's talk. Come on. This is one of my topics, so I'll, I'll swivel around. Where's your name? Where are you from? Uh, my name is Katie. I am from Massachusetts. What is your favorite meal? What is your favorite color? Uh, I really, oh, geez, put me on the spot. Um, I guess French fries because it's the only thing that's coming to mind. Okay. And I really love the color green. Okay. Well, just something to know about her, you know. Repeat your question again just to make sure the people on the line heard as far as, like, the multi-care team. Um, getting our different specialists to communicate to each other and work together to make sure that they are treating us as a whole. So one thing that I personally have done, so I'm not telling you anything that I haven't done, but in the corporate space, they call them all hands on deck meetings. And I have no problem calling an all hands on deck meeting with my healthcare team. And what that means is I don't care if you have to email, call, pop up, like the bad boyfriend that just pops up to your house, <laughs> pop up to the office and like, I would need to get on the calendar. These are the dates that my cardiologist, my sleep specialist and my GI can all meet. Can I get in this calendar? Because we all need to talk at the same time. I think it's important to um, have those touch points because if we just relay or expect that a database or a system or my chart or whatever the EHR system, electronic health system's gonna do that for you, Technology is great, right? I do not want to discount technology. But when you're dealing with people's lives, human being lives and quality of life, there has to be some human touch point there, right? That's with anything that we do. So don't be scared, intimidated, frightened to call an all hands on deck meeting with your team. And I think they will respect that. There are phenomenal physicians in this room that probably have lived experience of having all hands on deck meetings with the healthcare team specialists. Now, do respect that they may wanna meet as a clinician team first, and you can present what your questions are, mm -hmm. and say, hey, this is the gap, this is the experience, this is where I'm confused on, here are my three questions. Please don't give them 20 questions, please don't. Narrow it down to three. These are three things I would like to hone in for my healthcare team. And these are the things I want to get answered, and here's where I'm seeing the gaps mm -hmm. and the opportunity and then the challenges when it comes to communicating. 
And it could be that one physician's expecting that some labs are going to be ordered from the other specialist and that there's a lag in time of when the, the tests are going to be ordered or medication dosage where the medicine that you're on is giving you some type of cardiovascular response and you haven't had time to share that with the cardiologist, but you want your cardiologist to weigh in on what you're experiencing so that you can make a shared decision. Should I stay on the dose? Should I go up? What are the implications? Those are things that I'm sure individuals in the audience and online experience on a constant basis where there's a miscommunication breakdown and it also results in lack of accountability as far as if someone's ordering a test or an assessment, the patient expects a full roundup summary mm -hmm. and if there's any cardiovascular or GI implications, they would expect that their GI specials would be looped into the conversation. But once again, we're humans, we have a lot going on, life happens. These physicians are family members, parents, caregivers themselves too, so we have to give grace to the healthcare team as well. But at the same time, that's where shared accountability comes in and just reaching out, scheduling a meeting on a call and expressing why you wanna call the meeting and what are those three key points that you wanna have covered. Luckily, it may be an instance where they can just get them all on an email thread in some way in a my chart and you may have some answers covered not even showing up to a face-to-face -face meeting or maybe a Zoom call like technology has allowed us to do some of these things in so many ways. So thank you for that question. Of course. Um, anything else you want to add through um, multidisciplinary, like multi-specialist team and what we need? I would just say that I really wish that doctors would look at what another doctor did instead of having to repeat the same thing over and over and over again because somebody didn't look. Awesome. Thank you. Of course. We're going to do the prices right next and like come on down. This is going to be this is a good one. Let's give her a round of applause. That was a great question. Thank you for your thoughtful response. So, um on that note, when we're thinking about all hands on deck meetings, um, shared accountability, when we think about disease management and co-management, um, we want to find out what are the best ways to empower ourselves or our care partners or people in our loved one circle that is living with both diseases. Um, I would love to get the audience thoughts on how do you balance out of having IH or narcolepsy with another disease that also needs management? It could be diabetes, it could be osteoporosis, it could be you just got a hip replacement or GI, but how do you just overall anything that people are seeing as frustration points or opportunities to enhance um, the co-management of living with a sleep condition and a chronic disease? Uh-uh, that's my girl. She got to come on down. <laughs> come on down to The Price is Right. I met her at IH conference last year, and we stayed connected, and it was so good to see her this year. So let's give her a round of applause for coming back. I did not scare her away. Um, so I have narcolepsy, and then I have hypermobility, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and dysautonomia, migraines, and mast cell activation, activation uh, syndrome, and it's hard. It really is having to go to so many different specialties and trying to get in and wait for different specialties. But I think um, for me, having, like I do the research to find the right specialist that like knows those conditions and has experience. And then um, I, just moved from Iowa to Maine, and I've noticed my doctors in Maine are actually a lot better at communicating than um, my doctors in Iowa. Um, and I think it's kind of like having so many medications that also could interact with each other or make my symptoms worse for narcolepsy or like, just having the, it, it's hard, but like just advocating for myself has been the biggest part. And um, like just making sure I don't take no or like don't let them just not let me be included in part of my 
uh, treatment plan. I um, am just, yeah, taking 20 years to get diagnosed with narcolepsy had, I think, just kind of made me that way. Um, but, yeah. Awesome. I Thank you so much for that. Yeah. It's always good to see you. <laughs> so she brought up some good points as far as, like, individuals, life happens, we have to transition and move around. And our communication between our physician experience may change over time, but being open to a new healthcare team, um, but also ex accepting that there's still some things that we still have to improve. One thing is the medication management, and I don't have a magic wand or solution for that. I really don't. I'm not a pharmacist. But I know that it's frustrating. Um, it is scary. It is um, consuming to know that if you change one medication, you don't know what's going to happen in your regimen, that even outside of sleep. And then to know that the physician that is prescribing the medicine may not even be well informed of IH, but they're giving you this medication to treat this other disease. So I definitely show grace and compassion for you all that are managing that tricky experience. But I think one thing that we've seen is that pharmacists are now really, really, really empowered when it comes to rare and chronic condition. And there's some great pharmacists that are really good at educating patients at the pharmacy. So don't discount your pharmacists because they really want to help. And even if your prescribing physician doesn't get back to you, utilize those pharmacists in your, if your retail pharmacy or your specialty pharmacy, really take them up on any kind of opportunity to get patient education. I know I'm guilty. They, you pick up your medicines, like, you have any questions for the pharmacy? Nope. I'm well, like, you know what, let me take a step back <laughs> because there may be a question that I don't have and there's a fantastic pharmacist that is just waiting to help patients like you. So I just challenge everyone to kind of take a little pause there too to kind of examine that. So now I want to talk about how do we discuss the stigma of having chief complaints as an individual with a rare sleep condition or any condition and you're going into this office and I think it's so easy for some physicians and medical practices, not the ones in this room because they're phenomenal. I'm just gonna say it. Um, but the, um, the physicians will see every time Susie comes in, she's got a complaint about something. Like it's always a sick visit and she's got these lists of things and the stigma is that individuals living with an invisible disease such as a rare sleep that it's not in our head. And how do you kind of balance out the stigma that your symptoms may not be as worse as what you're communicating or the doctors may not believe the magnitude of what you're complaining or what your chief complaint is coming to the office or what your problem list is. Um, I won't call someone to the stage because I don't want people to feel uncomfortable coming to the stage. But if you have a show of hands as far as you've come to the physician's office with a sick visit or a complaint of something that's going on, and you felt like, I don't know if they really get what I'm saying, or I don't think they really understand the magnitude of what I'm presenting to them as an issue, and did I land this issue with the right specialist? Anyone from a show of hands had that experience? And that's a scary, frustrating, and stressful experience where you're going to see a, a certain type of specialist, and you don't know if that complaint should land with that specialist. Um, my thing is what I do personally, I tell them all. So some, it's gonna stick with someone, and I make a record that all those physicians know what my complaints were, even if I didn't see you um, on that day. It's nothing to send a message just to make them aware and let them know that there's a note, because some of these systems are highly connected. So when you go see your sleep specialist, your endocrinologist may get a flag and they may be able to take a note and ask them like, hey, can you go back and look and see what happened on May 1st when I went to the endo doctor? There were some great findings there that may help with some of our sleep discussions that we've had. So just kind of circling back that loop, once again, is more work on the actual consumer, the patient or the care partner, but just to hold that whole accountability circle of communicating and making sure that um, Everyone is in the know. Now the next thing that I'm going to say may sound a little OCD. I'm a little type A-ish. So I'll be kind of guilty about that. Is that when you have a physician visit and you're advocating for yourself, I block off time on my day. And when they have the summary visit in your medical records, and then they have the full detail. So like 
Not, you're in the parking lot and they got the summary note in the system. I'm like, there's no way. And it's just like a little synopsis. So I wait until the full note comes out. And if there's discrepancies, like, no, I didn't say this. This is, was not communicated. Oh, this was misrepresented. I go back and send a message and ask for that to be corrected. I don't wait until the next visit because we have so much going on in our lives that to think that we're going to remember this in the next three months, I'm not going to remember it. I don't remember in the next three minutes what I just said, probably. So I would just challenge people as an opportunity to consider to go back and take some time. So if you have a visit coming up in the next 30 days to make a note and look and see what they put in there. And from my lived experience, I've had stuff put in the record. I'm like, I didn't communicate that. I didn't say that. That was, and it's not saying I'm there maliciously doing it, but I'm helping from that shared accountability and quality control of what was communicated in the note compared to what I communicated in the visit. And I think that's important because that information lives around. And if that's shared with another specialist and it's misinformation or mis misrepresented, um, that's going to help um, support some of that, you know, gaps and opportunities for improved communication across different multiple uh, physician um, specialist streams. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was um, when we think about the bifocal view and you know what we have here for um, uh, a rare sleep condition such as IH or um, narcolepsy type one and type two, and then you have another chronic disease or condition that has to be managed, how does the audience kind of balance out what is in front of them right now on that given day compared to what's maybe a little further out? So let's take someone with diabetes, for example, or someone with you know, another disease that needs daily management as well. Anyone has any frustration, opportunities, or learning share there that they feel comfortable sharing? If not, I have examples, but. Just wanted to give people space and grace. There's one there. Hi, I'm Jessica. I have an N1. Um, I get frustrated a lot. You, you said, is there, you know. Um, I get frustrated a lot because I have uh, kidney disease. I've got migraines. I've got all this other stuff, um, GI issues. But when something pops up, I don't always know which problem it is. <laughs> Because it could be a symptom of all of the diseases. So it's like, is this a new chronic thing? Or am I just actually sick today? Do I have a cold? Or is this a bigger issue? Um, so I really get frustrated a lot with trying to pinpoint in myself where the cause is and what's going on. Absolutely. Uh, anyone raise a hand like, yep, I'm in the amen corner. I can relate. Yep. So I think... Um, I want to communicate to you to let you know that whatever decision that you land is the right one. So I want to say that to everyone. So if, if you wake up and you're not feeling well and you feel like it is tied to your kidneys, you're right, it's tied to your kidneys. If you wake up and you think it's tied to your IH, you're not wrong. I mean, I just don't want there to be um, undue stress on the individual trying to figure this out. Medicine is complex. I mean. There's no straight line <laughs> to figuring out some of these things because we're multidimensional. But I think as long as you communicate what you have going on with all of your specialists and your team, um, you can figure it out with a little bit of patience and grace. The other piece is that documenting out trends, so making sure like you're journaling, what you're experiencing um, on any given day so that when a physician does get the complaint and you can have like a seven day or 14 day record of what's going on with you, that will help your medical team even more on pinpointing that, okay, maybe we do need to take you back to your nephrologist to get some follow up or maybe we need to um, pull in your pulmonologist if it's something or your gastroenterologist. But I think patients do a really good job of collecting data and physicians and researchers really value that. So I don't want you to think that your time is being wasted or not honored or appreciated with the over-documentation that you do. You make the jobs much more um, palatable to kind of pull the pieces together to further understand what is going on um, and what could possibly be the root causes um, in that way. Um, and I think we as patients living with you know, sleep conditions, we don't like to hear trial and error. We hate it. We hate it. 
But, you know, sometimes we have to kind of rule out and process of elimination. So don't get too frustrated if we have to do some trial and error to figure out what is the root cause of something that is going on. The other piece that I wanted to talk about was um, topics and trends as far as um, when we think about rare sleep and when we think about the bifocals, I want everyone to go to their physician's offices and think about this as they go into their next visit or their next communication point with their physician. Even ask them, like, do you have your bifocals on today? No offense, but this is what I mean by bifocal. Like, you know I'm here for sleep, but I have these other things, so can you put your bifocals on? And everything that I'm telling you, think about it not only just from the sleep lens, but think about it from the whole person care lens. And then we think about whole patient care. A lot of health, health care systems are really focused on shifting the mindset of whole person care. So if you give context, I don't think people can get offended. So ask them, do they have their bifocals on? Give context and then ask them, do they have their bifocals on? Let me know if you do and how it goes, because I'll, I'll be interested to know how that goes. But when we think about um, rare sleep and some of the comorbidities in the, in the existing systems, this is something that's not just um, in, a, in a very um, confined moment. This is long-term and long-standing. So this is where you have to be slow and steady and give yourself grace, and it's not gonna be like a light switch. Um, it is gonna be a process over time, um, but even as your team changes, you may have a gastroenterologist, a nephrologist, a sleep specialist. You know, Five years from now, you may have an endocrinologist in your team and network. Making sure that you remain flexible and um, amendable to having all these different multi-system team players into your healthcare system and plan, and making sure you're understanding what works and what doesn't work so that you can modify as you learn more as well. Okay, any questions for the audience? Because I want to give space and time for anything there. So I have a question. It might be just my perception and it might be wrong, but somehow over time it seems to me that insurance has become very powerful and oftentimes they drive my decisions of what I can access and have and do more so than my doctor. And that is very frustrating and then as you Every year, insurance gets renewed and changed, medications reclassified. If you're even fortunate enough to have a job, if your job changes, all of that goes out the window. So how do you address the insurance piece? Oof, how much time do we have? <laughs> um, so I think we all understand the frustrations and the limitations of payers and insurance. Um, doctors are even more frustrated when they have to jump hurdles to get patients on a medications and letter of medical necessity and appeals in that way. Um, there's you know, limited staff in clinic settings that are kind of handling some of these paperwork and administrative work. Um, there's limitations on what pharmaceutical companies can do, you know, from a compliance and guidelines piece. So they, they've developed the drug and the market it and they want to do what's best for the patients, but um, they have entire government affairs and policy divisions within their companies that are trying to make things more equitable and fair balanced and accessible to their patient, to the patients as well. So just um, making sure that our industry partners are getting the honor of the work that they're doing behind the scenes as well. Um, but I think the piece is that Connecting with other advocacy groups that are really focused on access, and the Hypersomnia Foundation does a really good job with that. The Every Life Foundation and other patient advocacy organizations that are based in DC, they're really advocating to kind of how can we um, address these barriers where insurance and payers um, are requiring patients to get on these other drugs and fail it before they can get approved for another marketed product that we know clinically can support or possibly improve outcomes for a patient. Um, I think the other piece is that understanding that um, payers and um, the healthcare system and the physicians and the patients, there's more and more patients now that are um, advocating and staying up to speed on what the policies are and what things are coming in the landscape um, as far as like innovation and drug development. 
that will downstream impact how insurers will make decisions regarding drugs and medicines. One example is the Inflation Reduction Act, where there's um, conversations as far as incentivizing or not incentivizing rare disease innovation, and it has huge implications on how drugs and medicines could be developed and, and be accessible to patients. I think for you and for patients like you, connecting with advocacy groups that are really honed in on working with insurers and payers to educate them. I always come from the perspective that I don't think people have ill intentions to limit or to withdraw access, um, but I think them hearing patient stories and sharing your, what your limitations are and your bears and experience really enlightens them. I know people personally that works for insurance companies too and payers, and when I tell them the frustrations that I hear from patients, they have compassion. I want you to know that, that the people there are the payers, they have compassion, they have understanding, but some of the systems and processes that they have place, in place really limit them on what they can and cannot do. But that's when advocacy groups are like knocking on that door every week. And I also would challenge you all that if there's issues around access that are really big on you, Rare Disease Week is a really good week to get like, come to DC, come join me <laughs> and a lot of us that come here and really talk about this from your lens of a lived experience of what access issues looks like. Your state and local government representative, they need to hear that. Um, your insurance commission boards in your states. I would definitely ask for you to share your stories or if there's a way to connect with them just to make them aware of the frustration and experience um, as well. So those are just some tips and tricks there, but I invite everyone to Rare Disease Week for next year, so I would love for everyone to participate as well. Two minutes, any more? Oh, right, there you go. Hi, I was wondering, when you were talking about the co-management side of things, which do you think should have the priority? Like, there are doctors that all work together in one group, like my son is still in the pediatric world, but like Yale New Haven Hospital, you know, his gastro's there, his endo's there, you know, he's got multiple diagnoses, and they all work very well together, but do you think all being in one system is more important or finding a doctor that you think you connect better with even if they're not in the system? I think I, I'm a little torn on that one from my personal opinion. I think, you know, me being a female and a person of color, I'm personally more in tune of who I have a rapport with and who I can build trust with and know that long standing, they have my um, best interest at, at heart. I'm willing to go outside convenience land to, to, write, to find the right fit. I know for some individuals where you have kids or family obligations or you don't live in Raleigh like I do to have access to so many specialists right in your back door, the distance and time has to be a factor. So I think there's a balance of you have to find what's best for you. Um, healthcare systems that have multiple specialties have a tremendous benefit. Um, they have great minds there that are researchers, they're eager, they learn, um, they're willing to take on those hard cases <laughs> um, and to really pull up their sleeves and do the work, which is phenomenal. But I think it's very tailored to the individual on what's best for you um, in that way. So I think we may get differing answers, but there's no right or wrong answer. As long as you have a, a team that you feel like your physicians really listens, they learn, it's shared accountability, um, and that there's a continuous process of improvement of the patient experience. And even though you're still figuring out what's going on, you still feel like you're part, you're in the center of the decision making and the communication and you're not operating from the outside. I think that's critical. We had another question in the front. I actually had a comment for the person that was asking about advocacy. Um, the last couple organizations I worked for had a third party they paid for healthcare advocacy. Uh, my current company is called Healthcare Advocate. Um, if you switch jobs, and obviously your healthcare changes with that, um, check to see if that is a benefit of the organization. There may be an independent third party organization the company is paying for to have advocate in your corner to help you write all the forms you need to write, to chase down the doctors, to chase down the appeals. Uh, it has made a big difference in my wife's health care. She's the one that's got the disorder. Um, to have someone that I can 
delegate that paperwork to, right? Um, and I just want to point that out that some organizations also have that capability as well. So yeah, it's kind of dependent on your job, but uh, don't forget the advocacy may actually be within your corporate benefits as well. Great call out. I think this will be our last one. Thank you. Um, in the 14 years since my IH diagnosis, um, I have a couple of symptoms, one in particular uh, where I've had the same issue consistently for almost 20 years, and every doctor that I bring it up to, including my sleep specialist and my primary and other doctors, specialty doctors, uh, tests that I've done on my own, uh, I constantly hear the same thing, which is either um, you shouldn't have that problem or I haven't heard of that issue before. Um, and then it just stops there. So I'm just wondering if there's advice for continuing to tackle that because after like 14 yes. years, you just get to the point where you're like, should I just accept that people don't know why you have that problem? See, I, I come with the school of thought. I am the receipts queen. So <laughs> I pull up publications, um, open domain source of information and say, hey, there's, there's a case study here. There's a clinical case. Um, from a physician piece, I would love for you to do some due diligence and dig down. And if you don't have the answer, can you find another physician in your network to bring to me to help sort out this answer? Because this has been a chief complaint for six months. And here's the summary documents of my chief complaints. And at the end of each um, summary note, there's no solution or next step and follow up for the past six visits. So can we go and get a plan of action on how we're going to address this? Thank you. <laughs> I have a I have a comment for that too. Um, so, have you guys heard of Google Alerts or Google Scholar? Yeah. So, I don't know, maybe, maybe you guys all, all do this already, but like anytime I hear of um, like a drug candidate that I, it's gonna go through clinical trials or a physician that posted some kind of article that I wanna learn more about, like I just, add a Google alert or I search Google Scholar for what the disorder is and I just have them email me. And like I get, you know, if I hear a, a you know, a new drug mentioned in the, in a literature then you know, I have an alert so that I'm constantly getting like um, things emailed to me when something comes up. So for whatever your um, symptom is, Put a, especially Google Scholar is good. If you go scholar.google, then, then okay. it's like medical journals and stuff, so. Yeah, they respond well when you have medical journals, you can bring it to the physician office, but the Google alert, and then you can set up a separate Google email so it doesn't clog down your main email and just have like hypersomnia <laughs> folder of emails for your medical emails, so everything's going there too. There's one last one in the corner there. When a, somebody in the medical professional field says, I haven't seen that before, um, it'd be great marketing for a t-shirt. I presented something they hadn't seen before. I've said that to my doctor several times. But I think a lot of what we're talking about is this comprehensive, holistic approach when we're also dealing with something specific. And no one person or professional can be all things to any one person. So one thing I found really helpful is to say, what would you do if this were you? What would you do next? What would you do if I was your wife? Or I say that to my children, ask them, what would you do next if this was your daughter? And they're wearing a professional hat because they're supposed to, but it reminds them of the humanity and where we're our best in the problem solving together. And they go, oh, you know what? Let me ask a friend of mine or get a second opinion or here's someone else or the type of doctor or get support in this different space because we are really our best when we are leading our own advocacy, asking those questions and helping each other take the next step while the treatment plan develops. Um, so that's a question I ask almost every time. Even if they give me an answer, is this what you would do if it was your child? Um, would you prescribe this medication? Because sometimes that isn't where they would start either, but they were giving you the answer 
that they had that they thought you needed. And there's a space for both of those. Awesome, thank you so much. Well, thank you all for participating in my walk session, Price is Right, Remix, Bifocal View. If you have any questions, you know how to reach me. Uh, my email is veronica at Hypersomnia Foundation, so it's not hard to find me. And I'll be around for a few more hours too, but thank you all for your time here today. Thank you.